Okay, so the regular season begins this week, and I am personally feeling good about this team. Everything feels so peaceful and calm, which means we are only in store for a stress-free action throughout 162 games. Oh wait, I forgot what team I root for. Episode number 45 of the Mets Weekly Podcast, 60 Minutes of Brutal Honesty, begins right now. So as for your usual house cleaning, make sure to subscribe to the Mets Weekly channel for content throughout the week, as well as this very podcast that premieres every Tuesday at 4 Eastern time. Also, turn on post notifications to not miss the wrap up of our 30 projections in 30 days, which just finished yesterday, where we discussed a Mets player on the 40 man roster leading up to opening day going into the 2024 season for the past month. Follow us on Twitter, TikTok, all of our individual links that are in the description. So, this week, baseball games that count. Obviously, we had some last-minute excitement, which we'll obviously get into. Last-minute news, but it was last-minute good news, uh, which definitely is a welcome change because we've seen plenty of times where it's like right as the season's about to start, we have something bad happen. So uh, it was nice to see something good happen. Uh, the long-term ramifications, I'm sure we'll get into. But uh, it is interesting, though, because, you know, as far as the roster spots, who makes it, who doesn't make it, just a lot of interesting things happen that I, I'm kind of mixed on. Uh, you know, some guys that I feel got left out. Um, but I do think also it shows like some of the guys who are still sticking around, like you know, the G-Man Choi and, and Jose Iglesias saying they'll still stay within the organization uh, and not re- asked to be released. I thought it was very interesting. So what I like is that, you know, you have now a decent team in the minors where these guys that you could pull from uh, in case, you know, like we say, guys struggles, guys get hurt, whatever. Like the Mets have more depth this season. Than I could like legitimate major league depth than I could recall in, in quite some time. So I, that's the thing that I'm really encouraged by is that, you know, we, we've seen just so many different things happen. It's like, even if this happens, that happens, at least it's not just the absolute bums, honestly, that we've seen in the past or the ones that get called up, you know, at least these are players that we've heard of. And I, and I think that's shown in the spring training, the fact that there was legitimate debate, legitimate battles as to like, who should have made this team, who got left out, like, we haven't really had that I mean, you know, for this many, you know, both hitting and pitching. We haven't really seen that. So I, I think, you know, that's a credit to David Stearns and just like this overall new mindset they've taken of this quantity over quality approach. And, you know, we'll see how it pays off for the 162. I'm very intrigued. By it. Just get opening day here at this point, you know, like let's get this started. Let's get let's get the roster sort out. Let's get J.D. Martinez in this lineup as quick as possible uh, in a way that keeps him healthy. And let's go Mets. Thank you for that direct segue to the top story that I'm sure everybody knows at this point. I personally am happy that I can finally say this for the first time in five years. The New York Mets have officially protected Pete Alonzo signing designated hitter J.D. Martinez to a one-year $12 million contract earlier this week. Giving an instant offensive boost to the Mets lineup, Martinez is coming off another career year with the Dodgers, slashing 271, 321, 572 with 33 home runs, 103 runs batted in, a 135 weighted runs created plus across 479 plate appearances. After turning down a contract offer from the Giants earlier this offseason, when asked about joining the Mets, Martinez explained that San Francisco is not the best hitter-friendly park for me. If I go there, people are going to say that I'm washed or too old, and I will find myself out of the game. I want to give myself the best opportunity. Martinez is slated to earn just $4.5 million in 2024 and will receive deferred payments of $1.5 million annually from 2034 to 2038, creating around a $9 million luxury tax penalty on the Mets. 2024 payroll. 
As a late addition to the Mets roster, Martinez has agreed to begin the regular season in AAA Syracuse to ramp up for 2024. With his ramp up to take about 10 to 15 days, Carlos Mendoza reveals that he expects Martinez to be slated into the cleanup position behind Pete Alonso as the ideal situation this season. Mendoza also added that Martinez has been facing live pitching and you could see him as early as April 7th when the Mets are in Cincinnati. Martinez will be entering a 36 year old season with no signs of slowing down as one of the best hitters of this generation. With the inevitable destruction of playing time, the Mets have decided to option Mark Fientos to AAA Syracuse, with DJ Stewart expected to begin the season on the Mets opening day roster amid Martinez ramp up in the minor leagues regarding any other roster moves. Now, obviously, we already know about the impact that J.D. Martinez would bring to the Mets lineup. We've talked about him so many times on this podcast, so many times on live streams. Me and Roe did a live stream talking about the signing initially when it happened. Frank, you did a video on your channel. So, obviously, J.D. Martinez is a big impact, but there's also the other factor of Mark Vientos and the situation there. We can also talk about some other roster moves that were made as well so this is a bigger conversation obviously with a pivotal move such as jd martinez being added to the roster as early as maybe april 7th it's just very interesting i mean there's a lot of different angles uh and i think you know one of the big parts is you know we talked all off season about how you know david stearns hasn't lied to us he said what the plan was and all the moves have shown that and that's just it's been very consistent throughout the entirety of the off season and, you know, we wanted, at least, you know, Carson and myself, Andrew as well, uh, you know, we definitely wanted a DH in here. I mean, we, we've talked about it for years now. Uh, the power protection for P. Alonso is one thing, but the other part of just the designated hitter position not being a productive spot in the lineup for the Mets is the other big part of it. Like, that was supposed to be a good thing for teams. Like, oh, here's more offense. Like, this is a guy who does need to be a good fielder, just a good hitter. And it ended up being one of the weakest parts of the Mets lineup. Like, they couldn't find someone to just be in there and be a productive player. He shall not be named. Yeah, exactly. Plenty of guys who don't don't even want to name because we've gone through the list a ton of times. But J.D. Martinez is able to solve both of those things by batting behind P. Alonso, getting that power protection, while also addressing the designated hitter position. Uh, Obviously, you know, great against lefties. Like, there's so many things to like about it. Good guy in the clubhouse, mentor the young players, all that. But I think that, you know, just with the whole Mark Vientos angle of it, I, I've said it plenty of times. I just don't really see the long term fit here. Uh, and you know, even with even if he does like well, like even that's saying something because I feel like how many times do you have to, to send the guy to the minors? You know, I, I just find that like if they actually did believe in him, like the way they say they believed in him, he would have got his full time playing opportunity. Now, I mean, this is now three years in a row where he's going to play in the minor leagues and major leagues in the same season. So I, I think at some point you have to make a firm decision, like he's going to be a, like, a, I don't even know, a depth piece in the minors, or he's going to be a contributor towards the majors. And if he's neither, he needs to go for something that kind of helps your organization more. With Mark Vientos, he's strictly a DH, because if Pilon's here long-term, which he really should be, he's not playing first. We've seen him at third. That's not his home either. So the J.D. Martinez thing is like, because here's my issue. Let's just say you say, okay, well, you know, Mark Vieto is just going to do the job next year. You know, like we just have J.D. Martinez for this year. It's almost like, well, why did you even sign J.D. Martinez? You know what I mean? It's like, it's just kind of weird where it's like you put yourself in a position where then the pressure is on Vientos yet again. And it's like, okay, here's your opportunity. Get the job done. I, I feel like it's it's gone to the point now where it's like you just have to get somebody to kind of play that position and stay there that it, it's just become very weird. And I think the other thing that is just very interesting to me, like DJ Stewart making the team uh, and then this whole report of like he's going to tra- – they kept, they kept saying it on the broadcast during the game. He's going to travel with the team. That doesn't mean that he made the roster. And that's the part that's really weird to me is that I, I don't know where they're going with that. Uh, because they, they've talked about like, okay, there's a certain cap of how many pitchers you can have. So it's not like there's another pitcher that's going to make it over him. And they already told you J.D. Martinez is not going to be on the opening day roster. So, and we know it's not going to be Mark Vientos. So then who is it? Like, I don't know why they can't just say like DJ Stewart's on the opening day roster. Who else is going to take that job? I just can't see them looking at another hitter. I just can't see it because n- number one, there's nobody 
that's really like notable on the offseason market right now, hitter wise. That's like okay, they're gonna add this guy. Uh, and then if they did, like, what would their role be? Tommy Pham. Oh, my, oh my god, no, it, they can't. No, no, where's he gonna play? Why'd you get JD Martinez? Like, it, it's no, it, it can't, it can't be. Him. There's just no way. It's just weird to me. Maybe you don't sign Joey freaking Wendell. Yeah, there's not Joey Wendell. But I, I just think that it's just interesting to me as far as like what they're doing in the short term, what they're doing in the long term. I'm just, I'm really intrigued by it because it's like, to me, they've done this with Viento so much with the give him a chance, don't give him a chance, give him a chance. I, I would just move on at this point. Uh, I, I think that he's finding himself in the same position that guy who was a hot topic of discussion these past couple of weeks, J.D. Davis was in, where it's like you see the potential they have when they hit the ball hard, but if they don't get that consistent playing time, you're never going to see consistent results. And Carson's made the comparisons to the two of them all the time. They have the same strengths. They have the same weaknesses. They both struggle with velocity, particularly with that fastball, uh, you know, the, the ball up, uh, you know, trying to, you know, lift the ball, things like that. They may hit it hard, but, you know, the, the whips, like, I, I find that he's going to, and they both are not very good defensively. They're both supposed to be third basemen, but they end up becoming designated hitters. And it's like, I just feel like he's going to find himself in that same position at some point with the way they've treated this that it's like I, I want them to really make a concrete decision on, you know, kind of what they're doing going forward. And if that means training him for a guy who's, like, going to be more of a long-term fit, can do more things than just hit, it's something to explore. Uh, because right now I, I just think it's just an all-around just very weird situation. With, and not and like I said, J.D. makes a ton. I'm not worried about him. Like, I know he's going to do good. But I mean just, like, with Vientos, with Stewart, like, it's just some guys who just don't seem to fit right now. And I, I'm just curious to see what their roles are going to be and and how they're going to approach that part of it. Personally, kind of get the feeling of just in terms of Vientos that with Stewart, with G-Man Choi, uh, with all of these guys who are going to be starting in the minors, J.D. Martinez, when he's in AAA, it seems like they're trying to build like some kind of surplus of bats they could plug in at any point. But it's really hard to have Vientos as one of those pieces to the surplus when he well, is even one of G-Man those Choi guys too, that because needs to he's play another him. guy who's first base in DH, and it's like that's JD and Alonso. So it's like where, like where would G Man Choi even fit? Like as a bench bat, it's like who's he going to pinch it for? I mean, I, I have a guy in mind, but you know, other than that, it's like. I don't know. It's just the overall role. And like we talk about um, the value. We, we had this conversation was a couple years ago in the Mets. We're in the postseason run. Terrence Gore. So we talked about like, okay, well, what are the other things that you could do to make you worthy of a roster spot? Like what are, what are some other things you can do? And with G-Man Choi and even DJ Stewart, I feel like those guys are pretty limited. Like they kind of do one thing and that's really it. They don't have much versatility. So I, I just wonder from a roster construction standpoint, like it makes more sense why like a Zach Short would make it and Joey Wendell makes it, you know, just because they can do more things. So that's the other part that I'm intrigued is like, okay, you have G-Man towards the surplus, but really he should only be coming in for injury, honestly, because the other spots that he plays are by guys who should be playing every day. We also don't know what the deal is with Luke Voigt. We don't know. He probably is going to I, I don't even contract. consider him a factor, honestly. Uh, he was in the minors all of last year, even with their offense struggling. He looked terrible in spring. I, I don't, He's not even – he's, like, at the bottom, bottom of the peck. Like, I – He's just a non- again. It's it's part of the surplus of like yeah. those experienced bats or whatever. But I just don't think that Vientos really plugs into it very well because these younger players with the upside they need the opportunity to play every day, and I don't think that he should be seen as a part time player, especially with all that he was talked up to be all off season. This is a fantastic addition to the lineup. I don't personally see any other way you can put it that way just to put in perspective of how good jd martinez was last year his slugging percentage was 10 points lower than alonzo's 2019 rookie season that's the guy we're gonna have protecting pete alonzo right now yes granted he is a lot older but i'm pretty certain that he has at least another year left in him of being just a great power hitter he was just unbelievable last year he's so consistent his exit velocities are so great and consistent and we just need bombs it's that simple i think we need homers we need more homers in this lineup now pete's gonna get more strikes thrown at him in terms of like this whole situation with vientos look i was evolving on this subject I, originally i thought no we should just let vientos play as spring kept going it was and it wasn't even anything vientos was or wasn't doing i think i just realized that you know do i truly think that vientos ceiling is a long-term dh for us 
I mean, maybe his ceiling is, but like, I think it would be really difficult, a really difficult path for him to get there. Um, based off of a lot of the rates we've seen uh, in the majors. And I know he didn't get consistent playing time, but like, there's also just, you know, I, I worry a little bit that he would be basically a 2021 Bobby Dahlbeck, which when he had like, he had like 25 homers, had like a 35 K rate and like a 104 WRC plus. I think that was, in my opinion, the most likely scenario uh, with Vientos. And that's not good enough to be a long-term DH. And a guy like J.D. Martinez, who's one of the best hitters of this generation, would be an immediate impact, incredible addition to the lineup, which makes the whole lineup so much scarier and safer. You know, I completely support the decision to option him. I was a little confused about, you know, maybe he'll DH for 10 days, but, you know, I wonder if the reason he was optioned was because is it productive for him to see 10 days of high velocity and then just go right back down to the minors? I don't know. You got to think about that. Uh, just mixing up his situation, you know, he'd be DHing. Maybe Stearns wants him to play a lot more third base. I listened to his press conference today. That's what it sounded like. I expect DJ Stewart to make the roster. I don't see who else would make it over him. It does sound like the Stearns is keeping an eye on the, the opt-out uh, market of these players on other organizations. So we'll see about that. I'm really happy about the signing. You know, J.D. Martinez would have had 39 homers at City Field last year in 113 games. Th this is an unbelievable addition to the lineup, and I think that we have a legitimate shot at competing for a wild card spot this year. And we know that all these guys are one year deals. Most of these guys are unlikely to be back next year. So regardless if we're good or bad, this might sound a little bit too optimistic, but it's really kind of hard to see us losing <laughs> like in long term losing through this season. It's not possible for them to lose. Like it really isn't. Like if you're talking about in terms of 2025, if 2025 is the one when you're going to go completely for it, you can't lose. There's no way to lose with this team right now. And that's the good part about it. Now, listen, if you want, if you're upset that you have to wait another year or whatever, maybe. But again, it's one of those wait and see years that they kind of needed. And we, we've talked about this before. But also, I think this team is going to be in a wild card race and a dog fight for that yeah. last spot. You don't know what this team will look like at the trade deadline. It, it could look one way, it could look another. But maybe we'll be looking at adding another big bat, maybe a pitcher. You know, I, I'm just really excited for the season because, you know, how great would it be to have a winning season, but uh, which is kind of an appetizer for like a more long-term sustainable uh, stretch. I just want to see this team succeed. And I think the only way we could have done that, truly made sure we were doing that is by signing J.D. Martinez. All best of luck to Mark Vientos. I really think he has potential. There's no doubt about it. He hits the ball so hard. He's going to be in the majors at certain points this year. And I, I disagree with you, Frank. I, I think we should definitely keep him throughout the year only because... Who is your backup third baseman if he goes down? Uh, like, do you want Joey Wendell I, playing every day? I, I defensively, yes. I, I would rather have Joey Wendell play than, than mm -hmm. Mark Vientos at third. I, I, I'm that down on him defensively. So you would take Wendell over Vientos in a Beatty injury scenario? Or yes, I disagree. But you know, I, I, I hear that, and from that perspective, it does make sense to move on from Vientos. But you never know. Uh, he's a young player. He's going to get opportunities. And uh, you don't know how Beatty's gonna play, so I'd rather see I'd rather see both Beatty and Vientos play before I give Joey Wendell the. In terms of just JD Martinez, <laughs> Road, you just touched on it a little bit of how many home runs he would have had in City Field, and I made a post about this on Twitter. He played not even a full season last year, and he got. 479 plate appearances now roughly a full season of plate appearances would be 650 plate appearances and if you prorate jd martinez at 36 years old last year he hit 33 in 479 that would be 45 home run pace in 650 plate appearances and then you have 39 expected home runs at city field in 479 plate appearances which gives you the pace of in 650 plate appearances he would hit 53 expected home runs at city field so you are getting juice ball pete alonzo rookie year type of production from the power source at city field last year if he played a full season which is ridiculous i mean that is insane so imagine putting pete alonzo with rookie Pete Alonso type of numbers, who's also 36 years old. And also, by the way, you're only paying him $4.5 million. That's insane. The only problem is that uh, you have to, you don't get to play with Union City. You have to play some games in, in San Francisco, and, and then he's going to be washed and old. So 
you have, you have to factor in like those games in your projection as well. Well, also, we don't care. Second <laughs> off, <laughs> for Mark Vientos, I think that I don't think he gets traded before opening day. Like in the next 48 hours, they just move on from him, obviously, because JD Martinez is not a long term fix. We already know that he's not going to be here forever. Whether they re sign him after an amazing year, this year, in the best case scenario possibility, he ain't going to be here forever. Let's be real for a second. He's eventually going to retire as much as he probably doesn't want to. <laughs> All careers end at one point. Vientos, I think this year of how they're looking at it, the best way I could probably describe it is J.D. Martinez is hitting well, possibly trading Vientos at the trade deadline with him basically just rotting away in AAA. Then if the Mets are playing bad, J.D. Martinez is hitting well. They could also trade J.D. Martinez on a one-year deal as a rental and then call Vientos up at the end of the trade deadline. So I'm not going to put out any scenarios as J.D. Martinez not hitting well because I think he's going to be a productive hitter no matter what. I think we can pretty much pencil him in, whether at his worst or at his best. He's probably going to be giving you 25 home runs and being one of the best power hitters on the team. Does it kind of stink in terms of Mark Vientos? Yes, it does. I think that it's not fair to him. Kind of in the position that they've kind of put themselves in of the last few years. I mean, Mark Viento should have been playing last year. He really should have gotten all of the playing time after that trade deadline. There was nowhere to go. There was no reason as to man who now who shall not be named should have even been there. The guy was making, what, $1.5 million? Cut bait on that. He was going to be a free agent anyway. So, I mean, it just, it didn't make any sense. In that certain scenario, I feel like the Mets, they're going to try to clean it up and maybe get as much value as they could get from Mark Vientos if all is going well with J.D. Martinez at the major league level. Kind of a tough log jam when you think about it, especially when Mark Vientos was talked about as somebody as maybe they believe in him as a possible DH option. They want to see what they get from I personally don't think that they committed to Mark Vientos as much as people think they did. I think that they kept the options open. But in terms of the luxury tax, in terms of the payroll, they wanted to get the right price. They got the right price for J.D. Martinez. They even fixed everything around where he's making $4.5 million. It lowers the luxury tax penalty to like $9 million or whatever, which is like around the range of what they had set aside for the trade deadline. If the Mets, in terms of Pete Alonso, this could be, and we said this on stream too, this could be your last year with Pete Alonso. You don't know. Why not protect him for the first time in five years and do it, especially with, as Rhodes said, the consistency of Mark Vientos as to where maybe he isn't a long-term fix and maybe there isn't just a way you can display any consistency. Maybe, to be honest, the damage is just done. Like maybe, like at this point, he's coming into a 24-year-old season. There's only so much time he could just sit there rotting away in AAA if he's hitting pretty well. Speaking of more opening day moves, the Mets' fifth starter on the opening day roster has been announced, and it will be Tyler McGill. In a solid spring campaign, McGill has pitched 20.2 innings, surrendering 15 hits, 9 earned runs, walking just six batters and striking out 23. McGill's fastball is consistently sat at 94 to 95 and is top 98, also showcasing his brand new splitter, refined slider, and new bridge style cutter. Going into a 28-year-old season, McGill is looking to regain his footing after a fairly inconsistent 2023, where he posted a 4.70 earned run average, a 4.96 fielding independent pitching, striking out 18.5% of batters across a career-high 126 Point one innings pitched and 25 starts. Other rotation candidates such as Jose Budo and Joey Lucchese will begin 2024 in AAA Syracuse. When asked about when asked about Budo, Mets manager Carlos Mendoza stated that it's not just how he throws the ball, it's how he prepares. He did everything we asked him to, but it was a tough decision to make. Personally, I think the main takeaway here is you're going to see all three of those pitchers in Budo, McGill, and Lucchese sometime this year. But McGill getting the first crack at it, I think it was the most common. But Jose Budo had a really good spring as well. McGill, uh, I, I hope he's a serviceable fifth starter. No, I, I have been high on him in the past. Uh, his stuff is about, he has about an average arsenal. Uh, he's added more pitches, and I, I think that's going to help him out a lot. Uh, there's also a question of command. Uh, hopefully we see that improve. I would love for McGill to just give me a solid four ERA. Four ERA. That's all I want. He's a five starter. I'll be very happy. 
I feel like this is expected, so I'm not going to talk too long about it. But, you know, I am happy to see McGill uh, get the spot. Uh. I think McGill definitely earned it. Uh, and then, you know, once the Sanga injury happened, this doesn't really come as a major surprise, honestly. Like uh, we had said before, with David Pearson being out, like it was McGill's job to lose. Um, so, you know, the fact that he had the good spring training, displayed some new pitches and had success with them, I, I think was all, you know, definitely encouraging signs. Um, so, you know, we'll see how it, it works out because we thought that maybe they'd go the six-man route. It looks like at least to start out, they're not. Uh, and also, you know, in the first month of the season, you have those built-in off days, so it's a little easier to do that. And then also you probably have your rain blitz, which is then when you're going to see Budo get called up, 27th man, all that stuff. So I think that, you know, once Sanga comes back, I, I think that's where the real, like, discussion of what they do in McGill is kind of going to – become more of a topic where if they are going to go six man rotation or just send him down to the minors. So, you know, I think good on him that he had his good spring. He's able to make the team. Good thing that Budo had had a good spring training as well. Um, but, on, but all in all, this wasn't a big surprise. You know, it was his job to lose. He was kind of like that first guy because he does have the most major league experience as compared to somebody like Budo. I think lucchese has been in a little bit longer than him. But as for, I mean, McGill, I think that the stuff is just a lot more refined and a lot less erratic. There still is some erraticness, I'd say, like that you do you do have a little bit of concern there, especially with a fastball. He can but be very erratic, was, man, McGill. He, he yeah. definitely can be erratic, but you know he's a long guy. He's got a you know he's he's got a lot of motion to deal with. But I think if you can get fifth starter consistency from him, if you can get six innings of three run ball from him regularly, it would be nice. It's hard to see him going distance. Of course, it's it's really hard because he hasn't really been able to prove that. It seems like he does have better put away pitches now, uh, especially with a more depth in that certain arsenal, which is a lot more encouraging. Regularly throwing a cutter, which he did say that he got the cutter grip from Griffin Jacks. I actually missed that. Yesterday, I saw that. It was like, oh, this was two days ago. And apparently, Griffin Jacks, who has some pretty good upside stuff as well as a young pitcher in this game. So that's pretty interesting. I just like to see the depth in the arsenal just get bigger because I think he knew that he needed to add some weapons as well to kind of like coat in the erraticness a little bit as compared to what he's been able to do in the majors. And I hope he does put it all together because as we all have said, uh, on here, he does have some upside. He has the upside to be a really good pitcher in this game, and I really do hope that he takes it and runs with it. I don't know what the deal is going to be when Senga does return. I don't know if he does go down to AAA or not, but hopefully we do have a six-man rotation if McGill is pitching well by the time Senga is back. I do hope so. Now, throughout all spring training, one of the players with the biggest spotlight on them has been third baseman Brett Beatty. As a former first-round pick by the Mets back in 2019, Beatty really struggled last season on his extended look in the big leagues with just a 598 OPS across 389 plate appearances. But this spring, Beatty has continued to show improvement, going 12 for 48 with three homers, six runs batted in, four walks, five extra base hits in 50 four plate appearances. Earlier this month, Beatty opened up about his noticeable adjustments made in the offseason, working to follow through with a stronger top hand, using it as a guide to find the barrel of the bat more. Throughout still work in progress launch angle issues, Beatty has shown a huge jump from his pull side at a 50% rate and landing in the top 10% in average exit velocity this spring. The 24-year-old graduated prospect is expected to be the Mets starting third baseman on opening day later this week. Respectfully, he was the worst starting third baseman in baseball last year. It was there was I was not encouraged by anything I saw from Brett Beatty last year. Virtually, besides his exit velocities, the problem is that all his exit velocities are on the ground. And you know, this spring training, uh, you know, we have seen him pull some more fly balls. I think three specifically that have left the yard. At the same time, he has a ground ball rate over sixty percent. I really do want to give Brett Beatty a chance. I'm giving him a chance. That being said, I just don't know how confident I am that he's going to be able to figure it out this season. You know, I know he's been working on making his left top hand stronger, and I think that should make a lot of sense and really help him. Uh, you know, it could also take a lot more time than maybe we want for those new mechanics to really come to fruition. For a guy like Brett Beatty to really succeed in the majors, I feel like there's a lot of things that have to go his way. Like, 
he hits the ball on the ground too much. He can't pull the ball. He strikes out too much. His discipline isn't great. He has a lot to work on if he wants to be a productive major league hitter. And it's just sometimes it's a bit hard to really rely on that to come to fruition when there's so many things that he did poorly last year. Uh, you know, he was about a league average hitter in spring training, uh, WRC plus around 100. So if Brett Beatty's a league average hitter at third base, no, I'm happy. I think that's a lot better than what I'm projecting him for. Um, you know, I really want to see him succeed. I'm really rooting for him. I'm really giving him a chance. Uh, I'm just a little, I'm just a little bit concerned. I'm not sure how realistic I think it is that he is our long-term third baseman. Uh, in, and on the defensive side of the ball, he struggled as well. I think there's just a lot of things have to go right. And, uh, you know, we've seen him pull more fly balls. Uh, we've seen his strikeout rate go down a lot this spring. Um, you know, we've seen stretches of him pulling fly balls. Like when he got called up last year, he was pulling fly balls, a bit of them. Um, but still, we saw a lot of what we're seeing now, a lot of ground balls. I hope he proves me wrong, but I, I'm really just, I'm not sure how confident I am in Brett Beatty. I'm, I'm in agreement. The ground ball thing is, is still a problem. Uh, even, you know, last season he was at 50%. And like you said, right now he's at 60%. So it's like way worse fluctuated sample but like yeah I mean, it's a small sample but i mean just the fact that it's worse is not a, it's just not a good sign like it i don't feel encouraged by it i mean even the hit that he got today was on the ground uh he had a double play today like that's gonna happen when you're hitting the ball to the ground and they're saying the ball goes oh but he hit it so hard yeah and it makes the double play even easier you know so it's just like <laughs> He doesn't <laughs> – with him, he doesn't have the speed to get away with it. Like, Starling Marte's had a ground ball problem his whole career, but he's oh, he's always had the speed to kind of get bailed out a lot of the times, you know? I mean, listen, he had a bunt signal. Does that go into his ground ball rate? Sure, but it's also a hit. So I just think that he he's not able to redeem it. Like, if he's hit on the ground, like, it's over. Like, it's, it's, it's a rally killer, uh, you know? And we just had that discussion of, like, where he's going to bat in the order – and if Alvarez and Martinez are batting ahead of him, like they're not stealing bases. So those are a lot of double plays and just rally killers. So I think that, you know, it, it is tough when you have that kind of problem offensively and not to mention, like, he's just not a great defensive third baseman either. It's like we say, like, like redeeming qualities, like you're not a good defender, not a good offensive player. Well, why are you the starting third baseman then? You know, it, it, he's actually the starting third baseman by default. It's that he's bad. But the other options are worse, so he starts. Like, that's that's the kind of situation they're in. It's been a position need for a while. He was supposed to be the answer to it. Has not happened yet. And they really need it to happen if the Mets can actually, like, take off. It's like I've said constantly, but I'm not asking this guy to be an all-star or anything crazy. I just want to be average. If you could just be around league average on in the field and at the plate, We'd be good, you know, because we, like we said, we have that top heavy of the order that is very good. So if he could just be league average towards the bottom half of it and just not kill rallies, he'd be fine. Uh, but if he's just not getting it done on either side of the of the field, like it's it's a problem. Like I said, we've seen him go to the minors and the ground ball rate's not nearly as bad. And you have to think about it too: is that like he's facing a lot of minor league pitching in spring training. And it's st- and you so you would think that the ground ball rate wouldn't be worse, but it actually is. Uh, and he, like uh, Rhodes said, he's pulling more, and the ground ball rate is still up. So it's just like even though he's trying to you know be a more of a power hitter, like it's still just not working. So it, it, it just comes to the point then where it's like, is it ever going to work out? And really, you just don't know. But so far, it hasn't it just hasn't been good. You sure? Because like, listen, three homers and fifty four plate appearances that that's a that's a 36 home run pace right there. Right, so, yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> I will say one thing about Beatty this spring. He does look better, but it's still just not good enough. And I think that that's something that we all really feel is to, this is a 24-year-old, former first-round pick. To see small margin of improvement as compared to last year, it's not really encouraging. But I will say that I'm glad that he's showing a little bit more to the pole side as to compared to trying to use the entire field and just let the wind take the baseball and have it drop onto the floor. Other than that, I think that if the Mets actually believe in him as the third baseman, there must be something as to where they expect him to just gradually get even better and show a little bit more consistency as he continues to play. We do advocate for that, obviously, for these young players to get their 
footing in the major leagues to play every single day. It's not worth it for them to just be sitting on the bench for three days of six days or uh, get benched for two days or play twice a week. I believe that he does need to get the playing time, but I do think the microscope is a little bit closer to him as compared to if Vientos were to get playing time every day. Ronnie Mauricio was healthy and he was getting playing time every day. Beatty was supposed to be the guy. He was supposed to be the top guy, a first round talent. And we have not really seen that. I think that the expectations are high for him. And whether it's gradually getting better, I'm just really confused as to how long they actually are going to wait. I mean, let's not forget, if Beatty does struggle in the major leagues, he's not great at it, but Mark Vientos, if he's hitting in AAA, he could play third base. Again, you're sacrificing the run prevention that we like so much, but... If he's in the lineup, he's not contributing and he's just not progressing at all. You know, you're going to have to start answering some questions. And like Frank said, whether it is Alex Bregman or whether it is Eugenio Suarez or somebody on the free agent market, those guys have to also be in consideration. There's a strong possibility as to where Mark Vientos might have a majority of third base if Beatty starts off the first two months as such a negative asset to the lineup and doesn't show any improvement defensively, which, again, another point, but I think that Beatty, he's looked better defensively as compared to last year. I don't think he could have been worse, but like, I think that he was a little bit more focused out there at third base as compared to what he was last year. But besides the point, it's more encouraging compared to last year. But is it enough? I don't think so. I mean, we're at almost 500 career plate appearances for Beatty, so... We're getting close there to, a lot of Mets fans have talked about it, it's getting late early for Beatty. You know, I hope that it all does translate because there was some promising data from him all spring training long, but we need to see some consistency from it. And if we don't, then we're going to have to start answering some tough questions. Just go out there and prove me wrong. It's that simple. Yeah. He's been making a lot of adjustments, uh, you know, so I think we have to be a little patient as well. You know, into the season. Uh, I'm going to give him till June until I really start to be concerned uh, because, you know, when you're testing out new mechanics, it can take a minute to really tap into them. So, yeah, go out there, prove me wrong, and let's win some games. Same way with me because, you know, I've been just as hard on him, obviously, with the first-round expectation. And, listen, I, I want to see him succeed, but, you know, we need first-round talent from a first-round talent. I mean, that's just kind of how I see it, and we haven't seen that yet. So, hopefully... He can put it together, but can't really say that he's not getting the chance to do it because he is going to be the third baseman on opening day. Now, throughout all the young pitching that was on display during the Mets spring breakout game last week, there was one arm that was not featured, that being Mets top pitching prospect Christian Scott. And this week, Scott was given the start versus the Marlins last Thursday. And the 25-year-old right-hander was off and running, going four innings pitched, two hits, one earned run, zero walks, seven strikeouts on 59 pitches. Scott's fastball sat at 95 to 96 and top 97, showcasing 11 sweepers, seven cutters, and seven change-ups, registering 11 total whiffs and 14 chases. Coming off an incredible breakout season in 2023, Scott is expected to begin 2024 in AAA Syracuse with his anticipated Major League debut on the horizon in the near future. Scott is also ranked as the Mets' fifth overall prospect via MLB Pipeline. He climbed up the prospect rankings rather quickly this past year. And then when you watch him throughout this whole spring training, like he's just accelerating as far as his development and becoming a good pitcher at a rapid rate. Uh, and, you know, as Rhodes been saying, you know, let, let him start now, you know, put him, put him on the major league roster now. Like, uh, he's really just kind of beat out his timeline uh, to the point where it, it has gotten like, listen, the guy has, even if they kind of increase him through the levels, he's still just performing at a really high clip that uh, it, it's just been impressive. You know, you have like everything you see about him, you know, that quick compact delivery with just disgusting stuff. It, it's been very exciting, you know, especially as a organization that was known for, having great young pitching and we saw them all leave. Uh, we're looking for that next piece of homegrown talent. Uh, and right now he's the guy to, to be really, you know, keeping your eyes on because of how good he's been. So uh, it's definitely something very exciting because like, like we've talked about with the current rotation that we have now, a lot of these guys here on short-term deals, 
uh, having another person that's going to step in and be here for a long time uh, would go a long way in this team being competitive for years to come. So uh, I, you know, no need to rush him, but just keep kind of doing what he's doing and we'll see him sooner rather than later. And it, it's going to be a good time, but I've, I've been very impressed. And, you know, especially there's not a guy who originally was his top 100 prospect. This, you know, really early draft pick, not, not a first round pick. Like, like you know what I mean? Like he's just kind of, uh, exceeded expectations for, since the beginning, uh, and that that's been the other really encouraging part of it. He's not a guy that like, uh, like with Gilbert, these guys are going to make a big trade for. Like he's just kind of come in here and cons- consistently improved. Um, so th- there's definitely been a lot to like. And listen, I'm excited for when he finally makes his debut because uh, it's it's going to be electric. I'll always be honest with you guys. You know, I'll never lie. I'll always be objective and respectful. <sighs> That being said, Christian Scott has a chance to be a better version of Aaron Nola. I truly believe that. Maybe not in terms of volume. You know, it might take time to get there. This guy is incredible. His command is pinpoint. He doesn't walk anyone. He strikes people out. He's got good stuff. He has a good vertical approach angle. He has a great release slot. Really wish that he could be in the majors now, you know, ramp him up like the Braves did with Strider and like Stearns did with all his aces in Milwaukee, you know. Have him start in the bullpen pitch two to three innings at a time, work him up until they're ready to start, you know, in five innings at a time. Like Strider in 2022. I wonder if there's a reason he really does need to be in AAA to start the season because I don't know what he needs to prove anymore other than he can handle start his workload, which you can safely implement him into that workload in the majors. You know, I'm not mad or anything. Like I'm sure Stearns has his reasons. I can see Christian Scott being a part of a postseason rotation this year. Next year, the year after that, if we get in, of course, would like to be a bit more like objective. But like, I, I, I feel like I've just made so said so many things about him in past streams too, in past podcasts. I'm just so high on this guy. This guy, in my eyes, has to be in the Mets rotation by the end of the year. When it comes to Christian Scott, I think at this point, you're just waiting for that call. I, I don't think there's really anything that this guy really needs to prove. Maybe a little bit of sustainability as compared to last year where, you know, he ramped up a little bit. He took this huge jump and, you know, maybe they just want to get his feet wet. Maybe maybe he they also just want to stretch him out in AAA and not really risk the fact of him hurting himself at the major league level. And that being kind of like that first impression he gets there. But I think that at any time at this current moment where we are filming this 525 p.m. on March 24th, at any point they want to call him up, I think he's ready to do it. The AAA level is very fluctuated as to terms to the hitting environment is a little bit unbalanced. You know, there's rumors about the balls being a little bit juiced or whatever. So maybe you do see a few starts from him in AAA. Maybe they try to see uh, if that does fluctuate against his stuff. But at the rate that he's going, as we continue to see the stock go up on Christian Scott, at any point, this dude can be called up and it's completely justified. Now, most likely, Jose Budo will get the first call. After that, it probably would be Joey Lucchese. But he is there. He is right there to make his major league debut. I personally don't want to see him again. This goes for all of our pitching prospects. I don't want to see any of our pitching prospects up here because they're replacing an injured player or rushed up here. I want to see them up here because they are ready. And at this current moment, Christian Scott's ready. I think we all can agree that he is ready for the major leagues. Maybe just the volume is something that you don't really know what the deal is with him because he doesn't seem fully stretched out. But in terms of... Christian Scott as a pitcher he's major league ready in my opinion and I think at any point you can call him up when we roll out a six-man rotation I don't see why Christian Scott wouldn't be in that six-man rotation it would be the perfect time would it not like like if you're Good worried about stretching him, him out yeah. if that it's the perfect time to ramp him up as well you're right and, and just like Strider pitched about the same amount of innings the year prior in the minors he ended 2022 with 131 innings in total uh and Christian Scott pitched just under 90 last year like 120 130 innings I, I feel like that's a reasonable goal for Christian Scott to reach this year I I feel like a lot of that can happen in the majors you know and, and especially if we're gonna have a six-man rotation at times a few weeks ago I probably would have told you out of all of our prospects on the top 30 like typically I would have said all of them healthy, obviously, exception of Ronnie Mauricio. I would have said Drew Gilbert is the guy that I would consider possibly plugging in to the major league roster. Even though I don't like plugging in prospects, but if I had to choose, it'd be Drew Gilbert. I think that's changed to Christian Scott at this point. Yet again, at that moment when I did say that, we all know that 
Gilbert most likely has like or the highest floor, obviously, out of all the prospects. And with Christian Scott, I mean, he's adding new pitches. He's adding stuff to his arsenal after a fantastic year that he had last year. And he's getting results with those new pitches already right off the bat in spring training, which is just so impressive to see what this pitcher has done in such little amount of time and just basically just exploded through the minor league system. And at any point, I think that he is ready to go for the major leagues, whether it is for maybe some long relief or something like that to maybe ramp him up. But you're going to see Christian Scott in the majors possibly earlier than you expect, in my opinion. I think that maybe, you know, we talk about September call-ups and everything. I think you'll get him a little bit earlier. And, you know, obviously that has to do with the health of the rotation and everything, but I think that he's ready to go no matter what. I'm really confident in Christian Scott and his career going forward, and I think that he's going to be a great pitcher in this league because he has shown nothing but signs of dominance this last year or two in the minors. Now, obviously, we do have to address the rumors, especially with the offseason being as crazy as it is. A few days ago, Yankees announcer Michael Kay discussed the current status of free agent pitcher Jordan Montgomery. On his show, Kay reported the speculation from his own sources that the Mets are considering signing Jordan Montgomery if Scott Boris's price drops. Other teams involved in the latest sweepstakes for Montgomery have reportedly included the Red Sox, Angels, among other clubs. Mets president of baseball operations David Stearns has been public about staying involved in the free agent market when it comes to pitching, while also being open to trading for controllable starting pitching. The 31-year-old Montgomery is the only real top-flight free agent still available on the market with less than a week to go until opening day. When it comes to Jordan Montgomery, real quick, I look at him... And as far as like a contract standpoint, if I'm the Mets, the same way I looked at the J.D. Martinez thing. It's like, yes, he would help our team, but I'm not going to sign him until the offer is so good that I can't pass it up. Because I think that if Jordan Montgomery was as good as he thinks he is with the offer that he wanted, he would have got it. And I think that the Mets have been very smart of like they offered the billion dollars to Yamamoto. Not really, but they offered like the huge contract to Yamamoto, like multi-digit years, over $300 million. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But it wasn't like once Yamamoto signed, they said, okay, we're just going to give a bunch of money. We're going to take that money and then give it to either Snell or Montgomery. They said, nope, Yamamoto is who we wanted. We value him a lot. We don't value these other guys. So I think that that alone tells you like, that they're just not worth the big time money. So if that's the case, I you have to keep that same approach to the point where it's like, okay, Sanga hurt. Yeah, it makes you want another starting pitcher more. Top end, sure. But is Montgomery top end? That's still yet to be determined. I mean, when you look at his career, especially in New York with the Yankees, like he was good, but he wasn't the guy that he thinks he he's asking to be, like as far as like was getting paid. I think that, you know, for the Mets, what I would be more interested in is looking at something that's like, we'll play with what we have and then make a trade for a starting pitcher at the deadline. Uh, And someone that we like. All these young pitchers that have those controllable contracts, I would rather try to trade for one of those great contracts instead of overpaying for someone that I totally don't love. I just think that for the long-term fit, it just isn't there uh, based off of his previous performance and, and as current age, I mean, he's not getting younger. So I, I just think that, you know, if the Mets were to get in on this, I think it, it, and it might be a thing like Blake Snell, where it's like you get the three-year deal, but he opts out after one. And if that's the case, you want, you know, they could try to, I, I, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like I, they've tried to be like, they did the JD more, even though like to me, JD Martinez was a bigger need than, um, Jordan Montgomery and the Mets waited to structure Martinez contract in a certain way that didn't totally go over, over the uh, top cap threshold or whatever. That it's like, I don't think Montgomery's ever going to get to that point, no matter how they do it. And he's not someone that I would want to do some insane deferrals until, you know, a well, hundred years from now. Like, I, I just think that right now, just with the current team, current cap structure, all that stuff, like, 
I just don't think now is, is a right fit. Uh, so I, I think that, you know what, he's been the guy who's gone almost to the regular season for a reason. And it's because he's not as good as he thinks he is. And I always worry about, especially pitchers signing them at the very end of spring training or even into the regular season. It tends to not work out. I mean, we talked about, uh, I think uh, Tony talked about the J.D. Martinez cut, but someone like Dallas Keuchel. He was someone I remember very well that was like with the qualifying offer and, you know, maybe the Mets should sign him in the middle of the season once that there was that certain date, I think like in July or whatever, where all of a sudden you wouldn't have to have that compensation attached and all that stuff. And he was awful. And we've seen plenty of pitchers who they wait to like the middle of the season or into the season. They're not good because they don't have that spring training. Everyone's fully ready to go and they're not. So I just think that a lot of times that ends up not working out. So I, I just think that, you know, for multiple reasons, I just don't see that. Like, I, I can see the fit as the point, like, okay, Mets is a pitcher. He is a good pitcher. But I just don't think it's ever going to get to the point where, like, it the contract totally makes sense for this current Met team. I don't see this happening. I, I really personally just do not see this happening, like, under pretty much any circumstance. I don't think Montgomery is a low 3 ERA pitcher. Uh, he's a good pitcher, but I think he's more mid to high 3 ERA guy uh, just by stuff models. Um, and it's just prior performance as well. He did have an incredible postseason. He should be praised for that, and he deserves to get a good contract. But, you know, I, I don't think he's worth what he's asking for personally. And in addition to that, um, we have half the payroll coming off the books next year. And with this year, we'd have to pay twice. And I'm not sure I want a huge portion of our payroll going towards Jordan Montgomery when we have so many incredible pitchers and players on the market next year. I just don't think it makes sense for the short term. I don't think it makes sense for the long term. Uh, he would be a good name to have in the rotation, but you know, for the financials and the long-term outlook, I don't think it works for us. I, I would much rather see us rolling with this rotation, which I don't think is as weak as people think, um, especially when Sega comes back. I, I think it's going to be a pretty strong rotation. I'm just ready to roll into the season with this team we have. I think this team we have right now is what the team is going to look like on opening day. Um, and for the, until at least a trade deadline, you know, there's going to be waiver pickups and stuff, but you know, in terms of free agent signings, I think that, there's nothing else really to be done uh, that makes sense for the team and for the long-term future. So J.D. Martinez was that that big bat that we all wanted, and now it's time to focus on opening day and winning some games. I mean, I'm with both of you on this because I just don't see it happening, especially with, and again, I'm taking this with a grain of salt with Michael K because it's Michael K and he's Michael K. If at the current moment this week they're still waiting for the price to come down, that gives you your answer. The Mets should really just focus somewhere else. If they want to bring somebody else on in on a one-year deal or on a minor league deal, like there's a few decent pitchers out there who maybe could be a five in an emergency, like not Dylan Bundy levels of garbage, but like Brad Keller's available. There's a few decent pieces. Noah Syndergaard? Noah Syndergaard's available. That's another thing. Like, let's not forget, like... Could Stearns bring him to the high 90s again? The pitching lab. Obviously, there's still Mike Clevenger. There's a lot of baggage there. He's still available. If they want to add another pitcher, fine. But don't add a name just to add a name on the market. And for me, with pitching, three years is the max for like any pitcher out there, unless it's the top 1%. Let's say if Garrett Cole was available a few years ago like he was, would I match the nine-year deal that he got from the Yankees at that current moment? Yes, but obviously we weren't owned by Cohen at that point. If there was somebody out there that was a top flight piece, top 1%, prime Jacob deGrom, like a prime Max Scherzer, a prime Justin Verlander out there, I would give a long-term deal. Like if that was like six years or seven years, yeah, sure. But it's the most injured position in all of baseball. I know that Montgomery has stayed healthy, but you, you just never know tying yourself down to guaranteed five or six years three years is my maximum that i give out but also i'd love to have some options in there as well like i just don't like like tying myself down to the most injured position in all of baseball and to be honest with the price not really coming down of this whole report with the mets of course they want the price to come down the main thing that you have to ask and we all know we have probably the same answer on this is and i said this on our stream the other day with montgomery and I guess I'll ask you this, Frank. Are you willing to give Jordan Montgomery what Carlos Rodon got? No, definitely not. Exactly. I mean, that's and, what and I mean. That's that, straightforward. And, and, and Rodon was, you know, he was coming off just a good year as anybody. And that contract looking awful so far. 
Um, so no, definitely not. Because what do you get? Like five or like five or six years or whatever. Six years, one sixty-two. I think definitely that was what not. he got. I mean, especially no, exactly. And, and That's what like I mean. this whole like not just my garden, but the whole free agent market. Everyone's been getting three-year deals. Like, why would why would he get more than three? Like that would just with with what everyone else has gotten. That would just be crazy. So definitely, I'd probably keep him in the ballpark of what Bassett got. To be honest, that's probably the most I would give him. Yeah, what was Bassett? Okay. Bassett was three sixty. Uh, but you know, I think we're like Bassett is such a volume guy, though that like that is something I actually and so is Montgomery. That's what I mean. Like so is Montgomery. That's what I mean by that. Like I'm comparing that. I mean, I'm not. I'm not sure. Like with our payroll situation, I don't know if I do a three year deal worth sixty million. I don't think I do that personally. But, you know, unless it's like genuinely, like you said, a one percent type pitcher, uh, like Yamamoto or Garrett Cole or even Max Freed next year. Or Corbin Burns, I would pay a lot of money personally. I'm not shedding out huge bucks on the pitchers. You know, uh, Tony was on our stream the other day. If you watch your JD Martinez stream, all organizations should be trying to develop pitching out of their farm system because it's so expensive. It's such an injury prone uh, position now uh, that really it is getting difficult to. It. How logical it is to pay pitchers so much money um, anymore? Unless it's someone who's really young and or someone who's just amazing, especially with guys who are in, in their thirties, like Montgomery's thirty-one. He's in his prime, of course. But and and listen, I know that Montgomery's been relatively healthy. But once you pay somebody, there's always the risk of not getting what you paid for. That usually happens like eight times out of ten. There should be a hesitation there, especially with the luxury tax, of course, of their current situation, the payroll. But I think that he's a good pitcher. I think that he is going to be a good pitcher for years to come but i don't think that he's worth that top flight money that he wants maybe i don't know it's three years 60 million but you backload it for the last two years so it, it doesn't screw up your luxury tax as much but like how desperate are you at this current situation that's how i see it how much do you rely on the back end of that ro rotation i think that i'm willing to wait out Sanga then shell out more money before opening day for a pitcher who most likely, just like J.D. Martinez, he'll probably have to be in the minor leagues a little bit longer. He'll probably have to get, like, what, two or three starts in the minor leagues? So you're you're dealing with the same situation you're dealing with Senga, just with a guy who's signed and healthy. So it's just, for me, I just, I just don't see it as a good situation. I think that, again, you're a few days away from opening day. The time has passed, and, yeah, I'm just not shelling out six years to somebody like that. Um, which it's not a knock on him. It's just the Mets money has to be a little bit more protected as compared to some of the contracts they have dealt out where you know, Marte or Scherzer or Verlander or situations like that. It's just they got to be a little bit more selective on that and where they apply the money. It needs to be the smart investment and not a panic investment. Yeah, and then they're still paying Scherzer and Verlander even with them. They are still paying the team, Scherzer and so. Verlander. That's probably the main reason why they haven't pursued Montgomery as much as you think they have, yeah. or they're waiting for the price to come down. Now it's time for everybody's favorite segment, studs and duds. This is our last overreaction one because it's the last one of spring training going into opening day. How this works is for those of you who don't know, each of us give you a player that has played very well. We want to give flowers to, and then one player that has not been impressive at all and needs to step it up. I'll start with Frank. Your stud of the week. How about Tyrone Taylor? Uh, my only knock on him is the jersey number he wears. But other than that, I've liked what I've seen from him. I like that, you know, he's up there swinging. He's hitting the ball hard. hitting the ball into the outfield. We've seen the speed. We've seen the defense. Like, he just does a lot of good things for a fourth outfielder that we just have not seen in the past for Mets fourth outfielder. So um, I, I definitely like what I've seen from him, especially as like an add on for to get a starting pitcher like Hauser, who Hauser isn't great, but he's still like a, a viable starting pitcher at the bottom end of the rotation. Like to get that plus a quality fourth outfielder, again, I, I just think that ended up being like under the, probably under the rare, like one of the best moves the Mets just made the entire offseason to get both of those guys. Um, so I like what I've seen from him all spring. And this week in particular, he was just up there and just hitting the ball hard. I mean, just line drives right to the wall. Uh, just good exit velo. Just really good stuff out of Taylor all around. Yeah, there's some flaws to Taylor, but, you know, that's the reason why he's a fourth outfielder personally like you know the pitch selection's got to get a little bit better for him he's up there swinging he's aggressive it's what we kind of need from the bench just fresh into the game i feel like it'd be too easy to go christian scott here because we talk so much about him so i'm gonna go with a very unconventional pick that no one i i don't I'm, i would be surprised if any of you guess where i'm going with this 
John Duplantier. <laughs> if y'all know who he is, the Mets signed him to a minor league deal a couple weeks ago after Senga's injury. And I just want to say, he was up five ticks in velocity. This is not a joke. Five entire ticks of velocity. We were talking about this yesterday. It was crazy. Yeah. I do not have many expectations for him. You know, he's a guy who's sticking triple A. We know he was averaging 91 last time he was the majors. He was averaging 96. And he has a a nice release point too. He has like a extension over seven feet. And he added a cutter into his arsenal. So like, like imagine if he's like one of those Stearns guys that like, he just finds some random dude off the street and he's like a solid starting pitcher. It would be really nice. You know, I personally don't see it. It could be just be a really big fluky outing. But the fact that he added a cutter too that was like sitting like low 90. Like maybe this is a real velo jump. And like it's probably just the command isn't great. Which is why he has been unsigned. Pretty insane like stuff jump. It was just interesting to see. He made me look out at his stats. So for that I'm going to give him my stud. Kind of forgot the name and then I was like, "Oh wait, that's the guy they signed." And then all of a sudden you get like five ticks of velo and you're like, "What the fuck is going on right now?" I don't know if, you know, Statcast is misreading it or it's an outlier, but no, that was pretty crazy to see. But Harrison Bader. Yeah. Not to mention, let's say one thing. I was kind of worried about the chases. I would say that, but overall he's actually had some better pitch selection, which has been pretty good. We've had the run prevention in center field that has been impressive. We're seeing him pull some fly balls and line drives. I mean, he lifts the ball. He doesn't put that thing on the ground at all. From the nine hole, not bad. You know, it's probably going to be from streaks and inconsistencies, but overall, he's had a pretty solid spring. All right, let's get to some duds. Frank, I'll go back to you. Yeah, I have a couple, but I'm going to go um, with our opening day start, Jose Quintana. Back-to-back starts, not looking good. Uh, and then, really, my issue was not only was he giving up hard hits and what have you, he was also walking batters, which is not Quintana like and I know like with spring trainings it's like you have like these substitution rules but just the fact that you had to use it for your opening day starter was just not a great the fact that he wasn't able to get out of his own jams you know multiple innings he was running into trouble the stuff just wasn't there at all just missing spots he's a tough one because like he doesn't blow you away with anything that's like if he doesn't hit his spots it could get ugly quick and that's that's just risky, you know. So, uh, you know, like I said, now back to back starts, we've seen him just not get the job done. So, I, I, you don't listen. You're not always going to be facing, you know, Jordan Alvarez and Alex Bregman and and these guys. But still, it it's just back to back. Just re- did look it looked really bad yesterday. It's a little concerning again, spring training and what have you. But uh, we're now at like that late part where like, we're supposed to be building up our arms and being ready for opening day, and he didn't look ready. So I expect Carson to have a field day with this one. This is a player he is not a fan of. You know, he just started. He just got into some spring training games. But, you know, Jeff McNeil, he has not looked great um, in, in, you know, um, spring training, spring training, spring training. You always have to take that into account. It makes me a little bit concerned is like, you know, just, you know, Jeff he can be really hard on himself. He can really get riled up. And I guess that's just how he copes with his struggles. But in the spring training game, when he's like yelling at himself or fouling off a pitch, it, it's just not the mindset you that would help most people. Look, I'm not Jeff. What I don't know what helps him. You know what helps him is up to him. But you know it's just a bit concerning when to see him really treat himself like that in a spring trading game. This might sound like not a big deal, but I, I feel like it has kind of been a trend. If you go back to the first season where he really was not producing was 2021 and points the last year when McNeil's standing really up tall in his batting stance, he never gets hits. I've been seeing him do that this spring as well. A lot of there's a lot of times where he'll change his batting stance to a tall upright stance, and whenever that happens, like I, I, I it feels like I'm sure there's stats that can back this up. If you went game by game, he does not produce as well, and it's something I've been seeing this spring. To be honest, I haven't really been paying attention to him, but I did put him on here just because I just checked zero batting average. And that's not good. He is batting average king, and he's not getting it. So I had him on here. I also had Quintana on here. So you guys took those two. And I'll go with the third one, which is probably going to become old faithful, I feel like, for a long time throughout this year. Like, I'm not feeling confident at all. Starling Marte, second week of saying this. Again, I'm just scared to death as to what's going to go on. And 
Um, I'm pretty sure yesterday, at this point, our projection video on him, the last part of our 30 projections, but put this out a few days ago. Again, it, it's fluctuated. It's changed, obviously, because he's played since then. But at that current moment, it said that Starling Marte has put 28 baseballs in play this spring. 19 of them have been pounded into the ground. 14 of them have been hit under 90 miles an hour. Like, I understand trying to ramp up, trying to get healthy. But if he is as healthy as he says he is, we shouldn't be getting this crappy amount of garbage contact like Danny Mendick level of crap. Again, I've been worried about him all offseason, and I'm still worried about him going into this season. But I am not looking forward to these next two years that he is uh, slated in to be with our team. Um, whether he was good in 2022 or not, moving forward, I am not feeling positive about him, and my stance just has not changed whatsoever. Your rapid-fire stories for this week. Carlos Mendoza announced the Mets' ace, Kodai Senga, received an MRI earlier this week. Then the results have been deemed very encouraging. Senga will begin throwing within the week if he passes the Mets' internal testing. The next two rounds of Mets' spring cuts have been made. The following players have been reassigned to minor league camp. Ben Gamel, Trace Thompson, Jose Iglesias, Luke Voigt, Tomas Nito, Yalmer Sanchez, Yaxel Rio, and Cole Sulsler. The Mets have designated right-handed pitcher Phil Bickford for assignment as the corresponding move for J.D. Martinez. Bickford was acquired by the Mets from the Dodgers at the trade deadline for cash considerations. And also Mets manager Carlos Mendoza has surrendered his uniform number 28 to Martinez, switching back to number 64, which he wore with the Yankees for over a decade. Infielder Zach Short has made the Mets opening day roster. Short was claimed by the Mets from Detroit over the offseason, and GM and Choi has been re assigned to minor league camp and will begin 2024 in AAA Syracuse after deciding not to exercise his opt-out. The Mets have optioned right-handed pitcher Shintaro Fujinami to AAA Syracuse. Fujinami signed a one-year $3.35 million contract with the Mets this offseason, entering 2024 with a minor league option, which the Mets will be exercising. The Mets have traded right-handed pitcher Austin Adams to Oakland for cash considerations. Adams signed with the Mets on a one-year $800,000 split contract in in the offseason. Former Mets manager Buck Showalter will be returning to MLB Network as an analyst. Showalter was the Mets manager from 2022 to 2023 after working as an analyst back in 2018. Parting words for episode number 45. Michael Waka? Is that the first one that just copped, came off of my Pedro head? Pedro Martinez? That's Pedro Martinez. That's right. He was a Met at one point. Four days until uh, the season. Let's get it started. I can't wait, man. JD Martinez is a Met. You know, let's do it. Listen, we get to uh, David Stearns gets to meet his old buddies in in Milwaukee. So that it's weird to open against them. Uh, not used to seeing them as our opening day challenger, but uh, at least the season is you know finally here, and we are in the week of opening day. No more just absolute no names pitching and hitting and guys I never heard of you know playing. So at least we get to see our guys, the full nine innings, and we actually get to overreact whether it's good or bad. It's the young part of baseball season. The anticipation is killing us. I can't wait. I really can't wait. Last few days of spring training wrapping up now as we currently speak. We'll get to see the final roster cuts. It looks like pretty much everything is put into place as to a few spots or a few debates something like that but let's just say that jd martinez was a pleasant late surprise makes the team better as we've all seen from david stern saying that he wants to make the team better if an opportunity approaches and jd martinez quite the opportunity at 4.5 million dollars and uh, he makes the team better shall we say he makes this lineup a lot better on paper and hopefully he can produce for us throughout the entire year. But other than that, thank you guys for watching, listening. Make sure to catch the last wrap-up of our 30 projections in 30 days, which just ended yesterday. If you have not seen any of the episodes, there's a whole playlist. Let's go Mets. We'll see you guys next time.